Hello everyone, welcome back to the Privacy Guy. Uh, sorry, I'm dealing with some weird shadows here because the sun's setting out that window right there. Uh, but anyway, uh, today's video is going to be about the biggest threats to your privacy and kind of everyone's privacy in 2021. Um, what these five threats are, are social media apps <clears throat> and the data breaches that uh, may affect those apps. Uh, number two, social engineering threats. Number three, Internet of Things devices, IoT devices. Number four, uh, certain security vulnerabilities that come with cloud computing. And finally, uh, the security challenges that remote work creates. Um, so first of all, social media apps. Um, I've made plenty of videos discussing why apps like Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, uh, you know, are just not the best for privacy. Um, they allow people to, you know, collect the data that you willingly share, and they also allow for the apps to collect information uh, far beyond what you're using the app for. So, like, Facebook might have Facebook pixels installed on certain websites, and uh, so whenever you visit those websites, Facebook's able to recognize that you personally went to those websites and it's able to use that information to track you um, and serve ads to you based on your behavior, which is great for some people, uh, but for others, you know, it's not ideal. Um, <clears throat> Facebook's been kind of in trouble before for sharing uh, certain information from its users with third parties like Cambridge Analytica or, um, you know, other third parties that people who are using Facebook weren't aware of and then suddenly uh, you know these breaches and hacks come out and you know people are surprised and they're disappointed but uh, they stick around and they keep using Facebook um, some other threats are things like TikTok which uh, has you know been in the news a lot over the past year as far as it's like ties to China and other security issues with the app um, I you know, I don't know if the ties to China are legitimate. I mean, the business is owned by China, but as far as uh, I've read, um, the information that's collected from users of TikTok in the U.S. are stored on U.S.-based servers. So um, that could change in the future, and I think that's the biggest problem is when you're dealing with a company that is based in China, um, <clears throat> China and obviously the Chinese government uh, could use that data to track you, and that's obviously not ideal um, so my advice on how to avoid how to avoid these issues is to just simply avoid using social media um, and when I say avoid I don't just mean like well try to limit the amount of time you spend on Facebook because really that's not going to accomplish much if you have an active Facebook account Facebook is able to collect information about you anytime you interact with any Facebook product and anytime you interact with any website that has a Facebook pixel installed or any of the other apps that Facebook owns. So limit your social media use, but what that means is delete your accounts. Don't have inactive social media accounts that uh, basically require you to opt in to the terms of service and the tracking that uh, the given app will, will use. Um, so I'll make a later video about you know, some more specific tips on how to protect your privacy on social media. But for now, the most simple thing is to just delete your accounts and not use social media anymore. Next up, social engineering. Basically what social engineering, use, what, what social engineering is, um, it's when someone basically uses human psychology to influence people uh, to share certain information or to, you know, al allow certain things to happen um, for the benefit of this social engineering of this phishing attacker. Um, what these can look like is phishing emails. So you may get an email that appears to be from your boss. I know I've gotten these emails from, uh, that appear to be from someone who works in my company and then come to find out it's from a fake email account that's not on my company's domain and then um, you know it's asking for a favor and then that favor ends up being like free or like sending this person gift cards or something so um, <clears throat> you know some of these are better than others some of them are more convincing than others but 
Basically, what social engineering attacks are, are using information against you to influence you to make, make uh, bad decisions. And one, that could be sharing sensitive information. Two, that could be you know, falling into a scam, making purchases that you're never gonna receive the product that you ordered, um, or you know, simply just giving money to someone that you don't know, but you think it's your relative or something. Um, these come in a lot of different forms. You might get messages on uh, social media even that say like, hey, I saw you in this really embarrassing video. Um, send me $500 or I'll reveal the video. And then, you know, these people don't even have, the vi have any video about you, but they use scare tactics to try to trick you into acting how they want you to act. Um, and I think <clears throat> as phishing attackers, as social engineering methods get more advanced, uh, they use more information that they can gather, more public information to make you think it's someone like your bank, for example. Um, I think this, this uh, will become more widespread and harder to detect and easier to fall prey to. So uh, that's another thing to watch out for. If you get emails, verify the sender is actually who you think it is. If it's someone who works for your company, make sure that their email address is coming from your company's domain and not a fake Gmail account or uh, you know another domain. Um, so yeah, just pay attention to the minute details of certain communications that you think might be a little strange. Uh, that's kind of the biggest way to avoid social engineering threats and will probably pay dividends um, down the line when you're using the internet. Uh, third is Internet of Things devices, IoT devices. That could be a Google Home device, an Alexa device, um, or maybe a Ring doorbell or a Nest thermostat. Um, IoT devices are widespread. I mean, I know tons of people that have 20 IoT devices because they have you know, Google Home devices in five different rooms. They have a smart refrigerator that's connected to the internet. They have a thermostat that's connected to the internet. They have smart light bulbs. They have, um, I mean, a number of things. Um, smart appliances like dishwasher. I mean, the list goes on and on. But um, the problem with IoT devices is many of the companies creating these devices aren't taking security as seriously as they need to. Um, and what that means is if someone's able to access your internet network, you know, they might not be able to hack into your computer. They might not be able to hack into your smartphone. Um, but if you have an IOT device that doesn't have, you know, reliable security protection, um, a hacker could sit outside your house and use these devices to hack into other devices, hack into your network, and then they're able to monitor certain things and could allow them to collect more information about you to use against you in the future. Um, you know, most IoT devices that are created by a company like Google or Amazon are, you know, more likely to have better security, better uh, network security than, you know, some sketchy Chinese device that you don't know who makes it even. Um, and it, you know, connects to the internet, but you don't know anything about the operating system. You don't know anything about the technology behind the device. All you know is that it's connected to the internet. So um, don't use IoT devices from companies that you're not familiar with. And two, don't use IoT devices at all. Basically what these devices are, are data collection magnets, sponges. Um, <clears throat> I know that Google Home devices, uh, you know, they don't just track your voice when you say, hey, Google, or um, hey, Siri, or something like that. Um, they constantly monitor the behavior in your household. They track noise in certain rooms to determine the dimensions of a room. And if you're in that room, the presence of other devices, um, all of these things play into the data collection of Internet of Things devices. So. The fewer of these you have in your home, the less information you're going to be sharing with companies like Google and Amazon, and the more secure and private your data is going to be because you don't have eyes and ears in every room in your house. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, if you're using IoT devices, turn them off if you're not using them. 
that's one way you can kind of limit the data that they collect. Um, so keep that in mind if you have a bunch of Alexa or Google devices in your home. Next up is cloud computing vulnerabilities or security vulnerabilities in cloud computing systems. Um, you know, having large hard drives in your home um, just isn't as necessary as it used to be. Um, running servers uh, with the physical server, um, you know, is far less common than it was 10 years ago because now if I want to, you know, server somewhere, all I have to do is go into Amazon Web Services and create a server. And then, um, you know, I'm able to store certain information on that um, <clears throat> and I don't have to maintain a server on my own. It's just uh, controlled by Amazon. Um, I can turn it on and off as needed <clears throat> and I can get rid of it whenever. Um, so many of the computing systems that were likely you know, at your business or in your home are no longer needed to be in your location. You can keep them um, somewhere else. And think about other, other ways that we've kind of offloaded the uh, hardware uh, in favor of cloud storage. Things like iCloud or Dropbox or Google Drive. You know, you might store hundreds of gigabytes of files um, completely in a remote area, but what that means is in order to access those, you have to connect to the internet, you have to uh, communicate with a server somewhere else and have those sent back to you so that you can access them. Um, so this just, by nature of cloud computing and how it works, it creates more security vulnerabilities because if your network isn't secure or uh, the provider that you're using uh, is hacked or something, you could potentially lose all of your data that you have stored to a malicious third party. Um, so we've seen this before with things like, you know, celebrities having their iCloud accounts hacked and then nude photos are on the internet of, you know, hundreds of celebrities because iCloud was hacked or, you know, Dropbox files that are sensitive as far as like your work, like say your business has some proprietary information and you store it in Dropbox and then Dropbox gets hacked, then you're kind of just out of luck and someone else is able to get that information and potentially use it against you. Um, so <clears throat> uh, my advice on cloud computing is to avoid it if possible. Um, don't store your photos in iCloud if you have sensitive photos. Don't store your files in iCloud if you have sensitive files. Um, use an external hard drive that is uh, that uses encryption or some sort of protection so that you can't just access the files uh, without having like a password or something. Um, and then if you have to use cloud computing services, use one that takes privacy seriously. I know that um, you know Google Drive might be easy to use if you already have Google accounts, but um, you know, maybe something like drive or box.com or Dropbox or something else has better privacy protection. Um, I know there's like some encrypted file storage services out there and I'll be sure to include a link in the description of this video uh, to some of those services. But um, my advice is to just store things locally because if you have to communicate with the internet that creates security vulnerabilities and you're gonna be in a better place if you have control of the storage of those files and are able to access them without connecting to the internet. Um, and then finally, <clears throat> um, remote work security challenges. Um, obviously in 2020, um, many jobs and people in the workforce uh, suddenly were either forced to work remotely or were given the option to work remotely and uh, that's created a lot of security issues. Um, so think about before if you had a workforce of 10,000 workers going to an office every day and connecting to, you know, the building's Wi-Fi network. Well, you know, that is easier to secure that network because you can have your IT department uh, ensure that you're taking all the necessary steps to secure your network, that you're, you know, requiring passwords or MAC address verification to allow people to connect to the network. Um, <clears throat> and you can control, you know, which computers are 
allowed to connect to the network and which privileges each one has. Um, but as soon as people start working from home, um, rather than having 10,000 people in a single building, you now have 10,000 people in their own homes, in their own unique homes, um, all connected to different types of networks, all trying to access uh, different company uh, resources, whether that be you know store servers with uh, files on them or um, even just like company email. Um, now you have all these different connections coming. So uh, where before you could just lock down your network and only let people in from a certain location, um, now you have all these different people trying to access that from you know, potentially all over the world, at least all over the country. And uh, <clears throat> that just creates many different vulnerabilities. So you have people connecting to a company VPN, which allows them access to you know, certain resources. But um, let's say their home network is compromised and someone's able to view their activity and see that they're connected to this VPN and then could potentially allow for hackers to access your company network um, without being in the building, without um, you know, the traditional methods of having to go to an office and try to hack into some computer that's just in a building. Um, it's gonna uh, mean that many people might be using a different computer than their work computer. So there's just a lot of different situations that people working from home kind of brings with it as far as security and um, data protection goes. Um, so I think that's another threat that is going to continue to be an issue in 2021 and beyond is a more remote workforce is going to have to solve some of these privacy issues and uh, security issues um, if companies want to allow people to continue to work from home and maintain uh, proper data security. So um, <clears throat> that's all for today. Uh, just to sum it up, the biggest privacy threats in 2021, uh, as far as I'm concerned, are social media apps and then those apps getting hacked or having data breaches. Number two is social engineering and phishing threats. Number three is Internet of Things devices. Uh, number four is cloud computing issues. Number five is the challenges of remote work and remote workforces. Um, so I'll be sure to make some follow-up videos about how to protect your privacy on social media, how to avoid these social engineering threats, and then how to secure your IoT devices. So stay tuned for those videos. And uh, I really appreciate you guys watching today. So if you haven't uh, subscribed to my channel, go ahead and do that. Um, I'd really appreciate it. It helps me kind of spread my message of privacy and uh, you know helps me amplify that message a bit louder. So. Thanks for tuning in and stay tuned for more videos later this week. I'll talk to you guys soon.